<clears throat> thank you so much, everyone, and thank you, Griselda. Indeed, um, this last point brought up is very correct. I am very grateful to this Leverholm professorship because it allows me, together with students and artists and Griselda and some of the also teachers and professors, to think through what Documenta was. And when you are doing the Documenta with artists and writers and thinkers um, of various sorts and from various fields, as I did, you rush through a very um, intense experience, which is all full of, well, I'll think about that later, well, I'll think about that later, well, I'll think about that later, and so now is the later. So it's a great privilege to be here in Leeds and to have this professorship to allow me to do that So with you. And so I look forward also to your questions and, as always, your comments, and because they're extremely helpful. And the other question point that was made is that this is not a lecture about documenta. So anybody who's here wanting a lecture about documenta <laughs> is not going to get it, because I was asked in this particular occasion to speak about some of the specific artists' works in the documenta. And so it's not a lecture on curatorial practice or the why of the many aspects of how it was how, how choices were made, how the displays were done, how the works were made, the texts commissioned, and, and so on. The so-called concept, no concept, which has to do with being in the state of the propositional, all of this is not the subject of right now. It's a very, uh, uh, I would like to, to show you pictures of works and describe them briefly and um, bring up some of the questions that they raise. And I will focus on two in particular artists. One is um, <clears throat> Michael Rakowitz, Mike Rakowitz, and the other is Lea Porsager. But when we get to them in this PowerPoint, we'll just spend more time with them so that you can see the context within which those works came about. Uh, so as you can see from this, but none, nonetheless, uh, like five minutes, a little bit to give you a general frame. Um, the, the documenta took place in, with various temporalities and in various places. Uh, it started with a publication program called the 100 Notes, 100 Thoughts, which were small notebooks, which were published over a year and a half and then collected in one of the three volumes of the final catalog. Um, uh, these were not all texts about art. They were texts about why we do things in the world. And there are various strands that run through them. For example, one is the question of love. Love as a political category uh, and as what we are not willing to, um, what we are not willing to do in order for that. And this is ran through, for example, Etel Adnan, the artist's notebook, which was on this topic. It ran through Michael Hart's notebook on this topic, it ran through Judith Butler to uh, notebook on the um, comment on Hegel's fragment on love and others. So this is one, there are many strands that are woven together in that body of notebooks, and that was one of them. <laughs> uh, the other is what is a notebook itself? What is it to, to be in the state of the propositional? Uh, to therefore mark down something that you think you will forget. It is both a sign of a fragility and it is a sign also of wanting to create a past for a future, wanting to create an archival element that can be then retrieved for some future lecture to write or poem to read or artwork to make. And so this being in a temporality that is not uh, that work done, but, it, but that it is a past perfect is the state of those notebooks. And so one of the strands of that was what is a notebook. And that goes from Michael Tausig's notebook about what is a notebook to the a number of facsimiles uh, that were retrieved and published, such as Georgi Lukash's uh, notebook uh, on realism, where he, of his notes at the university in Berlin, of his class with Georg Simmel, where in the back pages he writes his first thoughts on realism and, and the novel 10 years before the book that he will then write. 
so there, the other thing that happened before the Documenta proper, the exhibition in June 2012, was a series of events organized by End and End, which was an artist collective created for Documenta 13, which doesn't exactly exist now. And it was created by Rene Gabri and Irina Nastas, who are also as artists participating in Documenta in first person. Uh, and also um, outside of Documenta, founders of the 16 Beaver Collective um, and many other, they have many hats that they put on. And for Documenta, they created this co collective called End End End, which was uh, organizing a series of events which had to do with political questions and the relation between art, activism and politics in many parts of the world and pl different places. Uh, and they were not particularly focused on during the documenta itself in Castle, exhibition part, but uh, they were present through a series of poetic fictional emails um, that were sent out during a year prior to the opening of the exhibition in Castle <laughs> and continued after that. Uh, so that's from a temporal perspective. Some aspects of what happened in Documenta also continue today after the so-called exhibition is over. For example, um, works concerning the uh, digitalization of the films belonging to the archives of the Afghan film in Kabul uh, started to be organized and uh, digitized and uh, repaired also. The machine was not working to create the internegatives again and so on. So a number of things that were initiated during the uh, Kabul part of the project continue after it. Uh, but not under the rubric of Documenta 13. So that has something to do with initiating things that will continue beyond the temporary exhibition. That's time. Place, place these four locations. The exhibition was primarily located in Kassel, um, as is traditionally <laughs> true for the Documenta, for a number of historical reasons, which have to do with the post-war period, post-Second World War period. But um, there was another uh, series of seminars, workshops, and then exhibition held in Kabul. Seminars also in Bamiyan, near where the Bamiyan Buddhas had been destroyed. And this exhibition comprised the work of about 30 artists compared to Castle, which was about 150 participants, but maybe 120 artists out of those 150. I'm just ballparking it because I never counted the specificities. Sometimes people are many things. Um, and uh, had an audience of about 40,000 people, which is extraordinary. Um, it was perhaps the first public contemporary art exhibition. But the reason why it's extraordinary is because it was not reviewed at all, even though Kabul is a place full of journalists and media. But it doesn't participate in the cliche view of what is life in a war zone. And therefore, the hundreds of journalists and media of various countries from all over the world in Afghanistan did not feel that it was of any importance to report on this exhibition and this, this event that brought together artists from Afghanistan and artists from other places of the world, seminars, artworks, and so on. So that was an interesting kind of a experience and in, in, in event. Alexandria Cairo, there was not an exhibition. It was um, a project around sleep and hope. and. The Banff uh, was also a solo exhibition of Brian Jungen's works, the artist, Canadian artist Brian Jungen, and a seminar um, and workshop on ceramic making uh, revolving around the question of the retreat. Okay, indeed these four locations, Castle Kabul, Alexandria, Cairo, and Banff, somehow on a very superficial level can be associated with the different positions that I brought up as the positions that an artist can find him or herself facing the world and de deciding or intuiting what to do, what is to be done, the big always question. These are not by far the only positions that an intellectual or an artist can have in mind, but they were simply the ones that I 
focused on with the uh, large team of people that made the document. It was not curated by me. It was curated by whatever that means, by a team of people, uh, about 13 so-called agents and about seven advisors. Some of these were artists, such as Pierre Huyg. Some of them were not even involved in the arts, like Donna Haraway or Anton Zellinger, who is a quantum physicist. Donna is a feminist and biologist um, and artists, as I said, and so-called curators were also part of this group. There was a growing group, and at a certain point, it just sort of didn't grow anymore after about a year or two into the process of making it. And, um, but the boundary between who was making, curating the documenta and who was in the documenta and was not organizing it was a very fluid and porous <coughs> boundary because many of the artistic projects within the documenta itself, such as, um, well, Rossella Biscotti or such as, um, Ma many of them were, you, you, Pedro Reyes could be seen even themselves as a kind of group exhibition within it itself. So this question of who made the documenta, we will never know who made this documenta. It is unclear. The four positions that I focused on that in a cliche way could be associated with these four locations are <laughs> stage, what does it mean to be in a state of performativity on stage? And that was, one would say, could say it's castle because it's an exhibition with 860,000 visitors and it's an exhibition, so you're in an exhibitionary mode, the performative mode. Uh, Kabul, uh, the second or another position that I was thinking about was uh, uh, under siege. What do you do when you're in a state of siege? Um, what happens as an artist or poet, a writer, a filmmaker, an intellectual? And you could associate it superficially with Kabul. Uh, hope, what uh, does an artist or an intellectual do when they're in a state of hope? Uh, you could associate it at the time superficially with Alexandria Cairo because of course we're in the middle of the Arab Spring and many of the artists, Egyptian artists that had already been invited to the documenta like Hassan Khan or Vail Shauki or Anna Bogigian uh, were clearly involved in um, a state of hope and were very busy at the time that than the last year of working on their projects for Documenta. So it occurred to me that this being in a state of hope was a very interesting position and condition that often brought you to do things that are not traditionally associated with, with art making. It is a kind of state of exception of artistic practice and suspension of that when Malevich stops painting and makes teacups or designs the bar for the workers for the Paris um, exposition. And then the last retreat was, is, of course, easy to associate with Banff, which is a ski resort in Western Australia. Um, um, and Marilyn Monroe actually went to Banff to ski. And it also has a very interesting um, artist residency program where much work on media art was done in the 90s. And um, there are more bears than people, 3,000 bears and 2,000 people. So it seemed like the right place to reflect on the question of retreat and withdrawal. And what does it mean to be in a position like Morandi, who withdraws in Bologna into his studio and paints bottles in the face of the worldly crises that are around? So, but actually, the process of Documenta was about unfreezing these four positions more than freezing them and classification in an old, old modernist way of classifying. And therefore, in each of these locations, which in a cliche way could be associated with one of these positions, what occurred was that um, there was a, obviously a hybridization of the positions. I mean, and we, all, we often have within ourselves hope, siege, retreat, and stage. And certainly castle is also in a state of hope because it's one of the remnants of the artistic system developed mainly throughout the 20th century in modernism of the large periodic international exhibition that um, offers this moment of collegiality or this moment of encounter between artists and this, this it, it is a kind of a remnant of an obsolete system of art, and insofar as it is obsolete, it is also extremely hopeful, <laughs> because I would ascribe to Nietzsche's 
in actual conversations that in obsolescence and in, act in actuality you actually have a huge potential. And artists generally approach participating in Documenta with an incredible sense of hope. It's felt as a kind of artist's exhibition, even though there's a huge audience, but uh, <coughs> because of the, they become almost tr custodians of the traditional heritage of contemporary art, because you have this palimpsest of works, Joseph Boyce's um, The Earth Kilometer of De Maria, and so many incredible things. Um, so therefore, generally, the, so, so anyway, these four categories blur and they're not so important and they, you can unfreeze them. They were just a tool to, to work with, that's all. That's not the art. Okay, Bode, it starts in a di disaster area, of course, that's Bode. This made me think about trauma and war in other locations of the world and in other times. This is the, uh, was built as a parliament by German architects actually in the early 20th century and then is devastated by war as well. It reminded me of the Friedrichshanum. Um, this is the Friedrichshanum after the bombings and the, no, excuse me, after the renovation for the first Documenta in 1955, which was not supposed to be a periodic exhibition. It was a one-time thing. This is the, my predecessor, Harold Zeman, same building. Um, uh, how do you say, Überflüssig? Uh, art is superfluous, yes. Uh, we're, it was, a, I think, a very important document, actually, that one, 1972. And this is the day before the opening. Um, the day of the opening, we removed the banners. There was a process of removal of advertising as opposed to uh, increasing of advertising as of the opening. So uh, uh, that was because it went towards a kind of... Um, uh, well, the, the, the art was supposed to be visible, and I don't think you need to advertise that document is on when document is on, especially not in Castle. So the banners were removed um, after the day of the opening. And these are some of the core group of people that I worked with. Uh, Marta Kuzma, Chiara Vecchiarelli, Pierre Huig, Raimundas Malasauska, Sofia Hernandez, Rene and Irene. Uh, Sung Jung Kim, uh, other people, Kitty Scott from Banff, Hetty Perkins, um, Kojo Kuo, and so on. Anyway, there was a statement instead of a concept. Can I read it faster than I can read? And you don't need to read it. it. It basically was written after the fact, not before, as a way of trying to bring together all of these interests that were woven together to make the documenta. Um, so there are many references that are embedded in it, of course. This is an uh, interesting, sort of, for me, more interesting mind map that was done two or three years before the Documenta. And it's interesting that, to me, is th that many of the things that I had thought about actually ended up happening, like the Lee Miller photographs or the, the Metzger. But instead of being the art of destruction of Metzger, Metzger then proposed the pre-art of destruction Metzger. And so for the first time, these early drawings that were very much about being in a state of hope, uh, drawings of, of um, a man and a woman making love, abstract drawings of figures, drawings of the Elgin marbles, all sorts of drawings that he had carefully put away in a kind of a um, safekeeping for 40 years, then came out uh, in this documenta. But other things that are here didn't happen, like the large glass or Hamilton. But there, it's it's. Um, but storytelling seems to have been fundamental for this. Science was present, of course, in, but more in terms of quantum physics and bi some aspects of biology, epigenetics more than genetics, for reasons that are political. That we can you can ask me maybe after. So uh, when you entered into the Friedrichshanum, it was kind of empty, which is odd, uh, because it's prime real estate. You would say for art. And that's where traditionally uh, uh, the documenta will p p position, position some key works and artists will want to be there. And in this uh, empty space, uh, you encountered a vitrine with a letter from Kai Altov, who wrote a letter of a withdrawal from the exhibition. And that of course, is there because I was thinking about retreat and withdrawal. Being uh, formed in Italy with Arte Povera, I'm also formed in Italy with the thinkings of the Autonomia 
philosophy, obviously, uh, Paolo Virno, Lazzarato, and these thinkers before have influenced my thinking. And Agamben also in his slight relations with the notions of withdrawal that are in his texts around potentiality and Bartleby and so on. But the autonomia thinkers are <coughs> more Tony Negri and so on. They were important to me in 10, 20 years ago. And so they, through this, and Arte Povera, so two things that seem very opposite, uh, very much something that is uh, about um, polysensoriality and non-visuality and in, 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 in enveloping the um, experience of art, of Arte Povera, and on the other hand, the notion of withdrawal and retreat. Um, some, another Italian artist in the exhibition was Francesco Mattarese, who withdrew from artistic practice in 1977 and has since then been present through this absence. And he had a series of letters also, which are counterpoint to this real withdrawal from the exhibition that were in a semicircle space called the brain in the um, Friedrich Channel as well. But what you really encountered entering into this space was what these two ladies encountered, which is wind and breeze. Not a very strong gust of wind, but a kind of delicate, slight wind that increased and was modulated in certain places like doorways and so on. And this was a part of the work that Ryan Gander, because we are in UK, so we can speak about some of the people who live here. He lives in London. And uh, he, he did a three-part part work, uh, or three works in the documenta. Uh, the first part, or there's, they're not in an order of one, two, and three. But one part was this um, wind in the Friedrichanum. And uh, people were intrigued. That's Ryan talking about his work. He's near Raimundas Malasauskas, who was uh, working closely with him. And people were intrigued by this apparent invisibility, but also very present sculpture, which is this sculpture of air and wind. There are many background research to it. For example, that in Kassel there is an important, historically, there's an important military industry. And there's also, connected with this, important industries around also fly, uh, airplanes <laughs> and systems for flying. So there, uh, the, there, it was very easy to find the right scientists or engineers, engineers, excuse me, that would have the technology to work with him in a very simple way, uh, to make the simplest solution for this question of creating the wind. Um, why I mention this is because often art is in a position of detournement of certain um, things that are built or invented for military purposes, like the internet or other things. And there's a question of changing the rules that are used or using things with different rules. And uh, it's a relation with play um, and anarchy. And the relationship between play and anarchy is also very important, like the poster, have a nice day, which is an anarchist slogan. And so um, this was not part of the concept of Ryan Gander. But because I'm talking to the artists now and not to cultural theorists, <laughs> unless they're here like secretly, um, I, this is just mentioned because sometimes there are these, well, because this detournement of a rule is often an artistic methodology. And because uh, of the chance encounters with materials or technologies or possibilities that you find in a place. So art is a lot less um, kind of mental and abstract. You know, I don't believe in the Descartian cut. And the, how can we think of the art history without thinking of what is there, you know, what a person has at hand to to do things with. It's very simple sometimes why certain things are done and other things are not. Um, but of course, what it d was connected with was with our conversations about uh, the question of the Aue Park, because uh, it was very important for me to locate the exhibition as well outdoors, not just in the 
closed venues, even though the board of the Documenta thought that was a nutty idea because statistically it rains seven days out of eight in the summer in Kassel. But I didn't really believe that. In fact, I think it didn't rain seven days out of eight. But I thought we could uh, sell umbrellas, you know, or something like that, or boots, and it wouldn't be a problem. I didn't, and also I think that if you are walking in the rain and you take your shoes off, it's a wonderfully um, way of also grounding yourself in developing other senses, which are not just the visual, but also touch and so on. So I thought that and we should have bicycles that it didn't, it, because of the walking, you know, there was this question of access, accessibility, which is a drama in our uh, contemporary artistic practice because the politics of those who believe in making art accessible are of course the same or similar to the politics of many of the artists, but the question of accessibility often impinge and render impossible so many artistic works. You know, it's impossible to exhibit a Cunelis today, a fire piece, in almost any museum in the world for health and safety reasons and so on and so forth. <laughs> so, there was this question of access and accessibility, so we worked on getting, I said, well, let's get some bicycles, and then we put buses that you could stop in different places for people who wanted to go to the, but that's sort of like administrative curatorial stuff, it's not important. But what was important was bringing the outdoors indoors and the indoors outdoors. So it wasn't, I was not commissioning artists who usually make sculpture outdoors in the park, that was not interesting to me. It was interesting more to bring the white cube or the black cube into the park. So artists who not necessarily would be showing a video piece or an exhibition of paintings, Doug Ashford, that one would normally put in the Friedrich Channel, why not make these rooms uh, to explode the museum and make these rooms uh, somehow autonomous to give more space between them than just passing through a door and going from Doug Ashford to Manon de Boer. So it had to do with temporality of the visiting experience and with overlaying of different memories into the mind of the viewers who's walking in and out of a park versus in and out of a train station and so on. So Ryan heard me talk about this and that may have been somehow influential. But primarily, I think he, he had had this idea previously and didn't, you know, you wait till the right moment or the right context to do things. So uh, this was the first portion. So it was very much about activating other senses that are not the vision and also about what it is to be with a crowd, what it is to reimagine a public space. <coughs> to become aware of that, of being with others. And he's talking about it, um, different forms of perception. And the second part of his work was the um, underground party. So there was a small slab in the Auer Park that most people missed, but it had a speaker in it. And you heard basically something going on underground, <laughs> like a party. So again, it's, it's, about, it's this relationship between visibility and invisibility, access and inaccessibility, being here and not being there, Castle and Kabul and Alexandria and Banff, but um, um, through, in this case, a sound piece. And the third part of his piece, I didn't put a picture, was a person, actually. There was a character uh, sitting at a table in a bar in the Neue Galerie that had a series of conversations with people. And we skip that. Uh, we're going through the park. Uh, one of the other pieces was, which became a kind of icon almost of the Documenta 13, was this um, bronze and found stone and small baby tree growing next to it work by uh, Giuseppe Pennone, one of the Arte Povera artists. Uh, this connects with, of course, Boyce and the 7,000 Oaks project, where from 77 to 82, he, uh, th th these, this whole mountain of basalt stones were planted around the city, planted, were positioned with a planting of a tree. And, um, but it also resonates uh, with um, other, this, the Documenta 13 was full of stones. <laughs> 
or objects or ceramic object. So it resonates with a number of questions about what is a place and how you can create a space a, uh, from a space to a place through certain dispositif of so-called things. So the artwork is, of course, not the stone nor the bronze sculpture, but it is in the relationship between the marker and the, what goes on around it. And of course, at night, we, I mean, in the morning, we found fire, we found bottles, uh, people had parties there, people met. During the day, people with dogs would go, uh, by, the dogs wanted to go because they're attracted to the tree. Um, there were many thing, events that occurred around it. So somehow the art object, not artwork, art object functions almost as a mediator or a kind of transitional object for the creation of this place of encounter. And it also connects with um, his earlier work. So in the late 60s, uh, Penone, outside of Torino, did a number of works which were about de-anthropocentricizing art, art as an encounter between human agency and the many much stronger other agencies of the other animate and sentient beings in the world, such as trees. So for example, this encounter, of course, we we're talking about a period when people were reading Merleau-Ponty all the time. He just had died, 61, and so on. Uh, touching is, what is touching is an important subject, and touching myself, touching the world. Uh, but this work was about um, um, the tree will grow around the hand. So it's this sculpture which is made in a collaboration between the tree and the human agency. And indeed, it's still there. Um, and the tree has englobed the hand almost fully. Another piece, early piece of his was uh, to prop up a tree with a rock. And the tree, of course, with its intelligence, grows around and with the rock and has a different shape that it would have had without the rock. So it's, again, an encounter of human and non-human agencies, uh, which lies behind his work. Now, here we have just a park, <laughs> the Auer Park in the late 50s, this idyllic uh, space, uh, artificial space. I don't believe in the distinction between nature and culture, by the way, and I never have, and neither did the Baroque, neither did Arte Povera. Um, either everything is culture, so the culture of trees that grow, the culture of bees that build their architectures, or everything is nature. The product of our brain is a consequence of subatomic particles coalescing into something called a thought. So whether it's all nature or all culture, it's an uninteresting question for me, totally uninteresting. And in that, I would ascribe to uh, Donna Haraway's thinking, of course, of the gray zones between the cyborg as the gray zone that's neither technology or human nature, but the, the, the wealth the, the blurring, the gender blurring, the so on and so forth. OK. So uh, in the park, uh, you encountered not this. This is a year before Documenta, when we were working with the trash company to collect trash. First, Hong Dong, he's on there, making his mountainscape, which then, at the time Documenta opened as an exhibition, was this do-nothing garden. Uh, not a particularly strong visual statement, because the green was on green especially if seen and photographed from the other side of where you see it here. Without the orangerie, it was really green on the green trees. So it became one of the least published works of the Documenta, but one of the most memorable ones for people who went to the Documenta. So somehow intervening in that space between the media and artistic experience um, by becoming invisible <laughs> in the media, but being highly perceivable in the space. And this. It was also very olfactive, as I mentioned earlier this morning in class, because he planted a lot of broccoli and broccoli family plants. So there was a strong odor next to it of plants, um, uh, intentionally planted. And the, 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 the letters say, do nothing garden in Chinese. So it's like my no concept concept, and it's his do nothing garden. And another work which uh, w we, you encountered at the beginning of the exhibition was uh, Maria Loboda, who, who uh, uh, could look like a rather lame installation by a student. <laughs> 
of a bunch of potted trees dispo formally disposed, uh, positioned to the right and the left of the main alleyway in the central area of the park. But instead, uh, this is what you saw if you came a little bit later, maybe two weeks later. And this is what you saw if you came maybe a month and a half later. So the trees were slowly storming, not the Bastille, but the Orangerie. And if you spent a hundred days in Kassel, the last days the trees had arrived at the Orangerie building and then the exhibition ended. So these walking trees were her little sentinels of, of, of markers of time and how you can construct spaces through the articulation of temporality in a way, which was one of the other currents and strands in the documenta. Uh, this is an image, a close-up image that a butterfly might have of the garden that Christina Buch, the youngest artist in the documenta, created for butterflies. So the audience of this piece are actually butterflies. Uh, people could also see it, but the so-called more aesthetically pleasing plants were more in the center. And on the, for reasons that pertain to food and so on for the butterflies. And this is all you saw. So it was a garden not made according to architecture, design of garden properties or visual harmony for people, but it was designed for the butterflies. And um, these are some of the close-ups. And sometimes butterflies did come. Sometimes she uh, released them. She, had, she lived in Kassel for 100 days, actually for much more, because she moved there way before the exhibition. She's a student coming out of the class of Rosemary Truckel, so perhaps the youngest artist in the documenta. I don't think she had even got her degree by the time this happened. But Rosemary uh, wanted to show me all her students' works which I think is a very interesting move. You know, there were no, not, I have nothing against, I really don't want to stereotype too much, but I was about to say, there were no male artists who showed me their students' works and insisted that I see them all. It might be a coincidence, but Rosemary Truckle took me, you know, two days of just everybody, you know, this artist, this artist, this artist, and they were more or less getting their masters with her. So. <coughs> So it was quite wonderful um, to, to have that experience with her. And indeed, Christina Buch ended up being invited because I thought she was so interesting. And she lived with uh, 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 raising butterflies in her apartment uh, that were released in this garden. And also, uh, spontaneously, other butterflies came. There was Pierre Huyg. This is the sketches for Pierre Huyg's work in the Aue Park, which was a kind of a compost. And I'm going to talk about this in the next Leverhulme lectures. This was an artist from Thailand, Araya Rajams Rusuk. And uh, she is uh, living in Chiang Mai and teaching at the art school of Chiang Mai. She basically founded the Department of Fine Arts at the Chiang Mai University. And so most of the younger or mid-career artists who come out of Thailand are actually coming out of her classes. Uh, Rikrit spends very little time in Chiang Mai, he, only a few weeks a, a year. And the so-called farm outside of Chiang Mai, which I visited, um, there wasn't anybody there when I went. But, but Araya has a very intense relationship with all of the younger artists. And in any case, Araya lives with her dogs. She has about 14 dogs that are st stray dogs that she's adopted. And, she decided, as her work for the documenta, to create a project on visibility and invisibility, withdrawal and being on stage, by creating uh, a living space for her. So she lived in the Aue Park during the exhibition in this little house, one of the many <coughs> little houses in the park, with one of her dogs that she brought from Thailand. And um, there were videos projected on the outside of the building that you could see through the cracks in the wood. She carefully designed the palisade so that you could see enough of the, of, of the, of the area that was her living space. Of course, it's about being on stage, the artist as a kind of the voyeurism of contemporary art exhibitions and the uh, experience of exhibitions for many visitors. Um, the quick, you know, I've seen that, seen that, seen that, seen that, rushing through an exhibition. So uh, being on stage for her is the same as being 
under siege, uh, besieged by the visitors. And about 800,000 people walked and looked through the cracks to see if they could get a glimpse of her. She very rarely came out during the day. She was out there usually early in the morning before 10 or after the closing of the exhibition at dusk. The videos, on the other hand, outside of the building were videos that were a collage of TV footage from the demonstrations uh, in Thailand at the time, which are still now. There are many crises going on in, in Bangkok right now, as we read, read on the papers. So it, it had something to do with uh, and also, there were some of her works with her dogs on them. So there, there was a relationship between media and the experience of art in, in that piece. Uh, Pedro Reyes uh, created a participatory artwork, which was developed out of a prototype that he had made the year before for the Guggenheim in Brooklyn as a special project. Uh, and this was his sanatorium. And the sanatorium was, in this case, the little house was designed by the artist himself. Uh, in most cases, they were not. They were altered by the artists. They were standard uh, prefabs that were coming from companies, uh, a company that um, ha is a mm, very good ecologically minded construction company that uses uh, c great care in the materials and so on, but still prefabs. <laughs> And um, he, in this case, is one of the, the artists who, having a degree in architecture, he just made his own design. And it was a hospital situation where the visitors were treated. Uh, and you could pick your um, therapy. There were six or seven different therapies. And the students of the School of Fine Arts of Geneva collaborated with Documenta in a very interesting project pilot project, let's say, that Chus Martinez, my uh, kind of, she was the agent that was closest to me, head of, so-called head of department, but I never gave the name of the department that she was the head of. So she was the head of department, but we don't know of what. Chus Martinez, who was the closest person to me in terms of all the curators and agents, proposed that we create this uh, alliances with schools. So it's uh, kind of, um, Art, artistic exhibition making in alliance not with art fairs and um, auction houses but with schools and this was a very productive system that cr uh, created for example this project which is that the students of the school got credits for participating it was like doing a seminar so it was it was a win-win situation it was also a way of avoiding precarious labor of interns you know getting all these artists young interns who are unpaid and, and so on. So in this case, the, the participants were, um, Documenta provided hospitality, housing and food, and travel in some cases, and they, the university provided the grant for their living and they, they got credits for it. And Pedro went to teach a seminar at the school in Geneva. So it was a very good project that lasted for a year prior to the opening of the Documenta. And, so that is a piece. Now, I'm just going to, ah, this is another piece. Um, I'm going to skip over some of them because we can't get to Mike Rakovitz and Dea Porsager, the two that I wanted to focus on. Prior to that, I'm mentioning another outdoor work. Uh, Marcus Lutyens, who I find one of the most brilliant. I mean, I, I learn a lot from artists, and I learn a lot from Marcus. He is based in California now. Uh, his work has to do with um, many questions. But in, in the case of Documenta, he, cre he created a reflecting house where the house, as you see on the left, it's a little bit high up on a hill. That's because actually the house is mirrored underground. So when you enter, you see the top part of the house as the same as the bottom part. He even created the gap in between the wall and the wall below. Um, and between the fireplace and the imagined reflection of the fireplace in order to give this sense of falling into this reflection when you descended the stairs, which are sim mirror image of the, of the roof ceiling. And when you descended the stairs, you would enter into these groups of hypnosis, hypnotic sessions. You could reserve and book like in the sanatorium of Pedro Reyes and he would hypnotize you. 
either individually or as a group. And he hypnotized over 7,000 people during the Documenta, installing art exhibition inside the head. So the art exhibition was a series of um, images. So it's not hypnosis for the purpose of stopping smoking. I mean, people go to hypnotists as forms of psychotherapy to, uh, for very practical reasons. <laughs> um, but, and it's rather common. It's not as rare as we think. And it used to be a very common practice in the early 20th century. Um, and in this case, he, it was, there's no purpose to it except for expanding the sensorial experience in the mind of the visitors. So um, you would pick certain colors and certain uh, things, and then that would is associated with a certain story that would be the storyline for the hypnotic session. So here, in a way, the exhibition space is only a portal to an exhibition which is unique to each person's brain and installed in their brain. Another um, project in the Awe Park, which I won't mention, now, we're coming close to Lea Porsager. Okay. Uh, Lea Porsager is a, is a young Danish artist. Um, and she was very interested in the fact that I wanted to uh, make these little houses in the Aue Park. And she reminded me that one of the earliest artists' communities was made like that. And it was the um, Monte Verita in Switzerland, near Ascona. And she decided that she wanted to make a project which was a research-based project. You could say that her work falls in the category of artistic research, if you want to put a label on it. It's not relational art, it's not this, blah, blah. it's artistic research art. That's one of those stupid labels that are put onto things by people like me. And <laughs> in fact, I just used it, but with embarrassment. Uh, so she will... Um, I actually think at this point I'm going to read a little bit of a text I wrote about her work that describes this project as well and show you some images of it. So this was the entrance to the original Monte Verita. People, um, man, many, many psychoanalysts, many artists went to the Monte Verita in around 1900. And it was also a nudist camp because it founded the idea that sun therapy, that if you take the sun, it can be very good for your health. Uh, this was, this is also true if you don't exaggerate with the sun, it's, it's also true for a number of diseases. These are a number of artists, Arp went there. This is me traveling to Monte Verita in the cave with Lea Porsager, where Gusto Gresser, Gusto Gresser was a poet who left the artist village uh, community and went to a cave above. He withdrew, again, the question of withdrawal, because he thought it was too uh, spectacular and so on to be in the artist's community. So he withdrew even from the withdrawal. Uh, and this cave is still there, and it's a kind of a place where old hippies go, uh, like a pilgrimage. You know, you go to see Gusto Gresser's cave. Gusto Gresser actually, after Monte Verita, went to Munich and he was the one who had made the, the, the famous um, way of protest of uh, holding hands in circles, which also has been repeated in recent years. He also traveled to Sweden and so the whole history of 20th century hippie culture somehow comes also through uh, Monte Verita, uh, Christiania and other communities like that. Uh, these are some of the little houses in the Monte Verita with Lea Porsager. And this is the little house that Lea Porsager created in the Aue Park in Kassel. This is an image of the inside, a little house with these small Dada heads. They look like Sophie Tauber Arp Dada heads. And there is a film projected on the side wall. Indeed, this house is more a, a space of passage where you a space of, of documentation of an event which occurred in one of the houses in Monte Verita. So a year after visiting Monte Verita, she requested the possibility to reenact in Anatta house the uh, some uh, um, experiments that had been done during those early years of the 20th century with her friends. And this becomes the film that is projected 
in the little house and that I would like to show you, which I have here. So we'll get to see some art. But uh, before that, <clears throat> I would like to just tell you a little bit more about her work. Uh, simply because I very recently just wrote a text for her and called it Enchantmentification. Um, <clears throat> Danish artist Lea Porsager's experiments are based on transgressing rationality and awakening alternative states of consciousness and body-mind experiences that create an expanded field of weird and mad reflections, a field of enchantment and fascination. Her practice, often containing references to alternative modes of perceiving and knowing the world in an attempt to go beyond the normal limits of daily experience and knowledge, echoes Kierkegaard's definition of the paradoxical and radical impulse in thought to reach its limits of understanding with a twist. And of course, she's Danish and Kierkegaard is also Danish. Uh, Kierkegaard had written, but what is this unknown against which the understanding in its paradoxical passion collides and which even disturbs man and his self-knowledge? It is the unknown. He meant humans, not man, but at the time people would write man, meaning mankind. Today it's quite rare in English to do that. Porsa, I think, I hope. Porsager's practice as an artist consists, first of all, in stumbling upon a subject matter that intrigues her. Various spiritualist groups, movements, and subcultures, the occult and or socially utopian visions and spaces of resistance. This is followed by reading about the topic, by doing research on the internet and in libraries and archives, as well as by going on field trips, quote unquote, which often lead to collaborations with friends and to performative experiments that might include tantric yoga, trance induction, and or hypnosis. These experiences are later shared in the public art world in the form of gallery installations comprising sculpture, photography, text, found objects, films, and videos that bear witness to the experiments and in turn become independent works. In Porsager's weird cumulative, associative, and research-based artistic practice, there is something that feels refreshingly of our time, and yet something that also feels radically past and perhaps obsolete. Her imaginary universe has touched, or might in the future touch, on any of the following esoteric practices. Advaita Vedanta, animism, anthroposophy, ariosophy, ascended master teachings, astrology, Buddhism, cannabis subculture, cognitive science, conspiracy theory, discordianism, eight circuit model of consciousness, entheogens, esoteric Christianity, esoterism, Freemasonry, fringe science, Gnosticism, Hermeticism, Hinduism, hippie subculture, human potential movement, integral theory, Kabbalah, leather subculture, metaphysics, neuro-linguistic programming, new thought, non-violence, occultism, paganism, neo-druidism, Wicca, pseudoscience, psychedelic music, quantum mechanics, Rastafari movement, Rosicrucianism, science fiction, shamanism, Shinto spiritism, spirituality, spirituality, Spiritualism, spirituality, Sufism, Taoism, Thelema, Theosophy, this is in alphabetical order, transhumanism and transpersonal psychology. To which I would add, because I got that list off of a Google search, uh, to which I would add environment, I won't tell you what I was searching, <laughs> to which I would add environmentalism, socialism, dark ecology, feminism, speculative fabulation, magic, alchemy, Ayurveda, hypnosis, crystals theory, WikiLeaks, and Kundalini Yoga, to name just a few interests of the artist that did not come up under the rubric of my Wikipedia search. And in terms of historical personages that populate her universe, one might mention Madame Blavatsky, Georgi Vadnovich, Gurdjieff, Jane Heap, Rudolf Steiner, Krishnamurti, or Alistair Crowley, Crowley, Annie Bizant, among others. In our advanced digital age of immaterial information and communication, of technological surveillance systems and corporate proto-fascisms, of exhaustion of the planet's resources and depletion of any social vision of the future beyond global financial 
social capitalism, poor Sagar's mad and wacky anti-information, her pastiches and recombinations of every possible irrational explanation of the world she can get her hands on and mind on, resist any political control because they define a vertiginous and striated space of complexity. Furthermore, her reperformation of occult rituals based on hidden knowledge that is or was shared by specific communities and groups of people could be said to repeat the sense of living in a world that has been black boxed and in which we cannot fully understand the secrets of high finance, for instance, with its insider trading, short selling, selling something you don't even own, and unethical operations shrouded by a mystique of technology and sleazy bankers. On the other hand, her research and projects break away from the secretive and covert operations of co corporate finance and surveillance systems by reconnecting her alternative occult world to the trajectory of visionary revolutionary moments in modernity. In fact, her work connects us back to the wilder social utopian and futuristic aspects of 19th century and early 20th century esoteric thought and practices in Europe, both those that were more socially accepted and those that were more occult. This was a bubbly imaginative period in which organizing science experiments, exploring magnetism, inventing photography and film, those mysterious echoes and ghostly apparitions of the real, reading tarots and performing seances to speak with the deceased, founding communes in remote woods that hearken to a new age, or organizing esoteric groups in Paris that connect with Eastern philosophies and religions, taking psychotropic drugs for mind expansion, figuring out quantum entanglement, or practicing hypnotic inductions where both the conscious and subconscious mind, the voluntary and the involuntary, are co-present. We're loosely connected to form a gray zone of modern culture between science and spiritualism. The lesser known trajectory of modernity, from alchemy to psychedelic drugs and anti-psychiatry, from spiritualism to the stuff that dreams are made of, was well known to the hysterics. Those sentient beings with hysteris, hysteri meaning the uterus, women such as Anne Radcliffe who wrote gothic novels instead of encyclopedias in the Age des Lumières. All of these impulses, practices, and desires were the hidden side of a rational, normative, and positivistic Western society bent on developing capitalism through eradicating the spiritual, controlling the material resources of the planet, and the colonial expropriation and exploitations of peoples and cultures, and the affirmation of the ego with a capital E, and human exceptionalism above the so-called natural world of all other life forms and sentient beings. Not only in the capital capitalist liberal system, but also in the fascist order and also in the socialist world. Seen from the perspective of today's ecological disasters and general global disorientation of a networked world based on paranoiac control and exhibitionary narcissistic disorders via the internet, these so-called rational endeavors of progress in modernity appear much less logical than they once did. And modernity itself seems much less factual and rational than it purported to be, and much more permeated by spiritualisms and forms of magical thinkings, those factiche more than facts that Bruno Latour identifies in Nous n'avons jamais été moderne, we were never modern. Um, and much less integrated than the worldviews of their occult opposites, the Madame Blavatsky or Rudolf Steiners of their times. There is something in Lea Porsager's work that feels futuristic and sci-fi, something closer to the way Wikipedia operates with its repetitions, image text connections, cross-references, and archival fervor and fever. So in the case of this, um, the spooky action at a distance. Um, I'm, uh, the question of witnessing is very important to her work, so which we will see in a moment, uh, the video. Um, the question of witnessing and the related term testimony imply the practice of storytelling, yet a particular kind of storytelling, whereby a certain adherence to the story, of the story to facts, to first-hand embodied experience, is presupposed. 
Etymologically, the Old English witness was an attestation of fact event from personal knowledge. Also, one who so testifies. Originally, knowledge, wit, was formed from wit, noun, and ness, so witness. So the witness is he or she who has first-hand knowledge and also one who tells or otherwise communicates it. Witnessing carries an ethical dimension insofar as it is related to the notion of truth, therefore, or rather of sincerity. By being a witness, we are stating that we have had a certain experience and we attempt to carry the truth of it over to another or to others through our telling or recounting of that truth experience. So Leopold Sager's Anata experiment, 2012 for the Documenta, is an example of witnessing as an artistic practice. The Anata experiment was inspired by the research trip to Monte Verita near Ascona in Switzerland that I mentioned to you. This trip that, that's uh, Lea with the person who runs the Monte Verita now. Monte Verita now is a hotel, unfortunately, <laughs> turned into a hotel. But the little leftover houses that are not used are in the garden. Um, the Anata experiment inspired by uh, her research trip to Monte Verita near Ascona, Switzerland. In the early 1900s, this hill was a place of spiritual rebellion, attracting anarchists, free love advocates, Dadaists, theosophists, psychoanalysts, and occultists, all rejecting positivism and an increasingly materialistic society of late 19th century modernity. The founders of the so-called, at the time, cooperative vegetarian colony Monte Verita, one of the first artist communes and retreats were Ida Hoffman and her husband Henry Oedenköven and the brothers Gustav and Karl Gresser that I mentioned this was the cave Karl Gresser, Gustav Gresser lived in. Some of these people are in this picture. Um, um, and the, while others who came to Monte Verita included Hugo Ball and the psychoanalyst Otto Gross and the experimental dancer Rudolf Laban without whom we wouldn't have Trisha Brown and, well, I mean, of course we would, but it would have taken another trajectory. I mean, things take trajectories also because of the people who do things. So um, Laban was also, uh, who uh, did dance classes, nudist dance classes at the, he then went on to becoming a Nazi when he left, but that is a whole other story, the story of Rudolf Laban. The curator of Documenta 5, Harold Zeman, believed it was a place of peculiar magnetic fields and esoteric meanings, able to bring together art, spirituality, and revolution in alternative lifestyles and under the aegis of Artemis, the goddess Artemis, the multi-breasted goddess of fertility and Gaia. That is why uh, there are these multi-breast uh, wood, multi-breast on the floor. That, that she puts, Lea Porzaget puts, um, the multi-breasted goddess of fertility in Gaia, and he collected an archive of objects and documents about Monte Verita as a kind of ghostly uh, project during the time he was working on Documenta. So I, it's his other, it's in a way his Alexandria, Cairo, Kabul, and Banff was his collection of materials parallel to his working on Documenta, which then, of course, become the next exhibition he does shortly after Documenta in 1978 is uh, dedicated to Monte Verita, and he will do the exhibition in the Monte Verita, in the Casa Anata, where Lea Porzager um, will do her, her reenactment of uh, early 20th century um, tantric experiments. In 2010, I visited, of course, I told you that already, it's just that I wrote it here. <laughs> and we, <laughs> excuse me, and we found the remnants of the old houses tucked away on the grounds of a contemporary hotel. We also found Gusto Gresser's famous cave just above the colony in the woods where he went to live in solitude for a period. In the late summer, so a year later, this 2010, in the late summer of 2011, as you can see, one of the Time is an advantage. If you're invited to an exhibition three years before, it's better. You have time to do your project and then cancel it, delete it, have another one, another idea, throw it out. It's much better. It's, it's really unbearable this way that art exhibitions are done so quickly and you have to come up with an art project in six months or whatever. It's crazy. Unless that is the topic of your work. That's a whole other question. Um, so we visited in the summer of 2010. In the summer of 2011, Porzager invited seven friends, 
There are also, if you know this, of course, seven chakras or centers of energy in our bodies according to Eastern religious religions and yogi practices. Tukkanasa Anatta, Monte Verita's principal building where many communal meetings had been held in the early 20th century. Casa Anatta became the scene for a week-long experiment in August 2011. In Porsager's words, quote, a vertical drop into tantric laws and processes normally obscured by the noise of productivity, ultimately finding its crux within Harold Zeman's archive and his puzzling Struktur Mutter, the Anatta experiment delivers a reverse coup de grace to the utopian Lebensreform and to the Mutter herself. Uh, Lebensreform are the ideas of social revolution uh, based on uh, forms of life that are reconnecting, for example, with the rural and so on. It's interesting to study Lebensreform, Tolstoy and so on, and these ideas in connection with today's attention of artists to seeds, of food, the whole projects going on in Detroit and, and so on and so forth and around the world and also in Kassel. So uh, she produced a video, which I'm going to show you now, the Anatta experiment, where her witnessing with her camera, the experiment, so she was not part of the, ex the, the tantric um, drop. Uh, her witnessing with her camera, the experiment of the seven women exploring their bodies, exercising the loss of the ego, because anatta means I am not me. Uh, it's, it's the loss of the ego. And centrally interacting becomes the breaking out of images from the frames over the events witnessed, where the images of the experiment travel through time and place until they are reached, until they reached a small wooden house reminiscent of the houses of the Monte Verita, which is the little house I showed you. But if you, it's a, not the right photograph because this little house is characterized by being a passageway. When you see the door, you see the grass on the other side and it's only a few meters long. So it's actually just a passageway as the Anatta experiment is a passageway. So until these images reached a small wooden house reminiscent of the houses at Monte Verita in Cal's Aue Park in Castle where the piece was exhibited in the summer of 2012. So another year passed to make the film and make the installation. The presentation included the film, a wall text, sculptural objects, specifically some egg-shaped wooden objects and other in metal placed on the floor that recalled Sophie Tauber Arp's Dada heads. After watching the film of the Anata experiment and thinking about its paradoxes, maybe we should watch it before I read the rest of it. Uh, Porsager and I discussed at length the essay, Remnants of Auschwitz, The Witness in the Archive, where Georgia Gamben indicates the paradox that no witness is truly a witness, since the true witness of the events would also be dead and thus unable to bear witness. Maybe, um, as Agamben writes, the value of testimony lies essentially in what it lacks. At its center, it contains something that cannot be borne witness to and that discharges the survivors of authority. The true witnesses, the complete witnesses, are those who did not bear witness and could not bear witness. Their survivors speak in their stead by proxy as pseudo-witnesses. They bear witness to the missing testimony. I think Agamben doesn't quote Shoshana Feldman and the book that was earlier than this text that says something very similar, but I don't think he read it actually. I mean, things can come separately. In this way, language is fundamentally inadequate and a lacuna for Agam Agamben as it collapses the possibility and is collapsed in the speech of language. Anatta in the Buddhist belief system means not I, not mine. From this perspective of this aporia, there is indeed a paradox in the collective attempt to experiment with an anatta state and then to transform that experience into a testimony by way of a film and an installation. If Porsaka's project is to try to eliminate the consciousness of witnessing by entering into an anatta state, it becomes further complicated by the fact that if one were fully able to enter into an anatta state, it would be impossible to bear witness to the experiment because in that egoless state, there would be no subject, no I, and thus no witness. And yet, the particular condition of the witness that cannot ever bear witness 
is not the entirety of the experience of witnessing. And in her essay on Alain René's film, Hiroshima Mon Amour, artist and writer Bracha Ettinger introduces the notion of a witness, achieved through the rendering fragile of the subject in love, communicating via a form of traumatized love. The most archaic psychic level of self is based on the maternal love that is traumatizing to the emergent subjectivity, the baby being born. It is a compassionate love with, within the non-I. What Ettinger would call a non-phallocentric theory of the witness is substantially a form of withness, almost a state of anatta, according to which witnessing an event is never a detached experience, but is rather referred to the fragile condition of the pre-birth and post-birth matrixial relations between the not yet mother and the not yet child. It is a perspective that, as Ettinger writes, quote, articulates trans subjectivity with compassion and witnessing forms of compassionate tenderness. Subjectivity is not the moment the I becomes aware that he or she witnesses an event from the outside, but rather an experience of this, and, and that would be the Butler uh, description of subject, you know, in a way, and, and many others, um, and to be subjected to, and also the, the Levinas, that the policeman looks at you, who I, you are, and, and in that moment the subject is constituted in fear, <laughs> who I, uh, don't kill me. Uh, subjectivity is not the moment the I becomes aware that he or she witnesses an event from the outside, but rather an experience of the, quote, space opened at the heart of the borderline between I and not I, a fragilizing encounter event which reconnects the knot between love and trauma and reactivated compassion, compassion. In this sense, the paradox of living the anatta experiment and bearing witness to it in the artwork the paradox of esoteric experience and esoteric artwork is overcome just and becomes in a way esoteric, uh, the opposite of esoteric. Just as the Cartesian cut between the thinking rational mind and the external world bears little fruit today. Rather than considering thinking as a mental activity only, or matter as distinct from language, for Porsager, as for quantum physicist and feminist philosopher Karen Barad, matter and language are not separate, and she eschews both constructivist and realist thinking. Okay, I think at this point, I think we should look at the piece instead of me blah blah blah. It's and the beginning of the film has no sound, so it's okay. I don't know how to get rid of all this stuff on the bottom. <coughs> yeah. It's not five minutes, it's like 15. So you can just sit back and relax. Because it takes time. So these are not actors, they are um, friends. But the space is actually the Anatta house, which since then has been destroyed, by the way. So this is the last document we have of the inside of the original Anatta house at Monte Verita. They spent, I think, a week together in this house.
just Thank you. 
So given the time, it was more than 20 minutes, I don't think we can speak about Mark, uh, Mike Rakovic's work as well. I had chosen two artists to focus on, but I think we have to just end here because it's five minutes before the end. So I think it's better if um, you would like to um, co ask any questions or, or comment on what you saw. Of course, this piece, for example, this, um, this work, uh, deserves much more than just a contextual description of <laughs> how she made it, what she was interested in, going to Casa Anata, and so on. Because now that the documenta is over, then it's time for these works to be also written about. And um, the structure of this film, the references to early film, the way that it goes from the inside of the house to the outside, the way she tries to treat color and filmic devices, um, nostalgia for certain uh, silent film, early film, and the references to the Dada, the Dada costumes, and so on. So there's so much to talk about which or to study that um, I'm not doing right now. So that's uh, a very small glimpse onto a very small part of a very large project with a little focus on one artist's work and how she came to it. And because you are artists, I think it was important to show you not just the film in the little house, but to show you what the process was. Because for her, I don't think the artwork is the film. I mean, I think the film is an element in an installation that is itself an element of an artwork. And the artwork comprises also the week in Monte Verita with her friends doing this uh, tantric vertical drop. I don't think that's um, preliminary research for. I mean, the preliminary research was the previous part that I showed you pictures of. So there are parts of art now that are visible in the so-called art system and parts of art that are not visible in the so-called art system, but it's still part of the artwork if one were to write about it or think about it. So the exhibition is just a small moment of together the exhibition as an apparition instead of exhibition, maybe apparition. And the inhibition and the pre and the ghostly part are all part of the work. OK. In any case, does anyone have any questions or comments to make? On And the other point is, obviously, to see this film, this video in a little house that's so narrow and pa away, uh, she knows that most people will come in and not see the whole thing from beginning to end the way you do. So this feeling of also somehow repetition is also because she wants to make sure that whoever goes in there will have a certain, within three minutes, three minutes, three minutes, will always have a certain amount of elements in it. So it's like an expanded painting almost, rather than a narrative with a beginning and the end. Although it does have a narrative, because it ends with the outdoors and the going into the, into the woods and so on. So there is a, a kind of a narrative structure, but she built it in a way that it would be ex an interesting experience for people who spend three to five minutes maximum in front of it, obviously. So it's not for a cinema as we saw it here. OK. Also on the previous part, the um, PowerPoint that you saw some things. I just wanted to ask you yes. at the beginning, you talked about ethnogenesis. You said it was political. Talking oh, yes. About the, I just wanted uh, to just well, intrigued. Yes, well, you know, um, ha, that's a big question. <laughs> that's a really big one. Um, well, uh, genetics, like neuroscience, serve many purposes. Uh, they can serve purposes which are beneficial through medical research for curing certain diseases. They can also serve other purposes which have to do with the corporate control over life. 
In fact, Vandana Shiva wrote one of the notebooks about the corporate control over life through an analysis of Monsanto and other corporations that have genetically mapped um, seeds of various sorts and then proprietarily decided that they were, by modifying one small element of the genome, that they have, brand, that they have um, proprietary rights over that plant. And that, of course, brings in a control over the food of the humans on the planet because genetically modified seeds are also terminator seeds generally. So if one generation of farmers has a bad crop, the next year you cannot make, you don't have any seeds to plant and you don't have the money to buy the seeds to plant. So on the one hand that and on the other hand the fact that uh, GMO seeds are running around. I'm just taking one example of seeds, but we could talk about bodies, we could talk about many other things. GMO seeds of cotton, for example, uh, are devastating areas of the world where there's no food being grown because it's more profitable to grow cotton, GMO cotton, or corn for fuel, alternative fuel. So therefore you have a, also again problems of uh, unbalance and devastation of Food, um, store, f food for, for humans and uh, loss of the possibility of the human different people and local communities to have their own control over their own food. And that's the first time in 10,000 years that this is occurring <laughs> because the whole society is based on the birth of agriculture also and moving from hunting, gathering to agriculture. So if you suddenly, slow, slowly, within 20, 30 years, detach those two, you're in for a big political crisis and also for an incredible power over the populations because you have control over food. If you have control over food, you have control over people. So it's the, that's why the food is such a big important issue right now, food and crops. So genetics uh, were based on uh, uh, identifying and owning. Now, the thing that is, and, and also there were these ideas that you could even clone people or clone animals and so on, or you can, that now the, 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 the good news is that that's ridiculous because genetic sequences are actually change over even one generation and they can change very quickly. So you cannot really uh, ever arrive at that science fiction sort of control over a body like cloning a person and so on. And epigenetics are the study of what occurs around um, the genes and how the environment will influence the, the genes and actually change the genetic identification of a living entity. So I think there's a politics that's behind epigenetics, which sees it more uh, as a system of influence of the environment, of the environment on a micro level of a body or of a, of a cell on a macro level. So that it's, it's really a, uh, the opposite of genetics. So epigenetics is a branch of genetics that's actually the opposite. That's saying that um, if you were to see it as nature nurture, it's the nurture side uh, rather than the nature side. That, that everything changes so much according to what happens in the interaction of the genes and around the genes. So I think it's a political question to liberate people from the fear also of the genetic control and also to understand this politics of symbiotic evolution within cells rather than seeing it as this code that tells you what you are, what you are destined to be. You know? So that's what I mean by there's a politics around epigenetics that's closer to my way of thinking than genetics. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering, um, are the artists handpicked um, in relation to coincide with the statement, or is there an application process that they go through? Uh, 
there is no application process for participating in Documenta, not even for directing Documenta. Um, but the statement was written after about 150 people were involved in it, in a way, uh, or maybe 75 people. So uh, the statement was never given to the artists. The statement is something that I wrote to try to make sense of what I'm interested in. And I would say what we are interested in, because the, this, there was these seven or eight agents that became 13 and that and many times it's artists who introduce other artists and so on. So this is a really complicated question. Uh, but no, the, the answer is no. The artists arrived in various ways and they were not hand-picked by anybody, not even by myself, except for maybe a small core of five to ten people that I have many years of working together with, like Janet Cardiff, William Kentridge, Pierre Huyghe. Those are people that I've learned from and that I share a uh, parcours, an intellectual life with and a living life with over 20 years, 30 years. And so uh, I tend to invite those, the core group of artists that grows with time from one project to another. Uh, Lawrence Wiener has been in all my group exhibitions, if you notice. You know, he's part of this core group of people that I talk to. Um, and it grows because, unfortunately, some people die, but some people you meet and you want to continue a conversation with. Basically, we would have these meetings that were rather informal with seven or eight or ten or twelve of the agents, and they would talk about what they're interested in, and they would say, and the work of, for example, Tamara Henderson, Chus would say, but oh, your interest in objects, and you put this and you put that in, so you have to see Tamara Henderson. She's very interesting, and she's doing a work around this relationship with objects and so on. So okay, let's see the work. So in the end, I never invited anybody that I didn't want to, but the people that were invited were the result of the interests and loves and friendships and intellectual relations of a number of people. And these number of people themselves expanded <coughs> to include other people. So it's not a, um, it's not a system that, it, it goes back and forth between what you're talking about and interested in and discussing, and then the artists or the participants who are not artists, because this documenta did not include only artists. There were philosophy seminars, uh, there was a, a literature project, there were writers and novelists who came and spent weeks there and sat in a Chinese restaurant at the end of the hour park and wrote, and then they would do things for the audience as well. There were physicists, there were biologists, so there were, there were politi political activists, there were people who were not, so it's not an exhibition of artists, but it, because of the history, my situated knowledge, I mean, I know more artists than, and I am interested in art in particular, but there was no rigid boundary to you have to be an artist to be in Documenta. And the, the expansion of it would bring in more ideas also and modify the original statement or that wasn't written yet and change it. And so it's a kind of osmosis that goes on between the inside and the outside. More like a big, rather open party that a lot of people can crash. But it starts with the core of a house and a person and an invitation of a certain number of people. But you cannot say that it is a democratic <coughs> process in the sense of democracy, political system of, um, you know, it's not an open call. It was not an open call. I have done exhibition like open call. Greater New York number one was open call. There were 2,000 applications and it was a process that went through that. I mean, there, there are projects that are done, that I have done as open calls, but this had more to do with an organism, how an organism develops. I think we should stop there. And thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Yes. Space, time, and some very important about the critical practice within it, but also the intimacy.
energy with which you work with houses or give the space to us to work projects. So this is not, you know, a, a big sort of shop window for galleries, sort of the stable mm -hmm. artists of the big galleries. Obviously, <coughs> many artists have to be supported because the projects are timely and time consuming and expensive. But it is very much to do with what we're trying to introduce and make available to you through the Slavic University Professorship. Something to do with understanding in depth a particular critical practice that engages with both fine art histories of art, cultural theory, uh, art and design, for those of you who come from the art and design uh, section, to really understand in a much more deeper way what these processes might be that, that you just go to and consume and tick off and done not the man to So we're going to have to spend quite a lot of time with it. Most of the material will be filmed, is being filmed, so there will be an archive where you could re-listen to some of this material. Anyway, thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you.